Welcome to the eighth webinar, the wider webinar series, how is COVID-19 changing development? The wider webinar series features a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists who present new research on the implications they foresee of COVID-19 for global development efforts and also the economic, political, social impacts of the for the global South. The title for today's webinar is COVID-19 and the role of RCTs for development. Our previous seven webinars looked at what we knew about the effects of the pandemic in the Global South. In this webinar and in the next two webinars for the rest of the year, we'll do something different. We'll look at big picture questions in development. First, in this webinar, on which methods should be used to study the effects of the pandemic on economic development, as an example. In the next two webinars for this year, on November 24th and December 8th, we look at the implications of the pandemic for globalization and the future of aid. This webinar is also unusual as it is in effect a book launch. The title of the book is Randomized Controlled Trials in the Field of Development, a Critical Perspective, very recently published by Oxford University Press. Because the webinar is a book launch, you'll have a slightly longer time for the, for, for the webinar than has been the case previously. The webinar will run for an hour, 15 minutes. Now, last year, Nobel Prize Committee awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics to three economists, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and Michael Kramer. Normally, when we have Nobel Prize Economics awarded, there's always a bit of debate. But perhaps last year, there was more debate than, than normal, actually. And the Nobel Prize Committee said that this particular Nobel Prize awarded to the three economists for the contributions to the experimental approach to economic development. And in particular, pioneering the method randomized controlled trials, RCTs in short. Of course, the debate and many of the questions that were raised are, are very relevant and for today's webinar, and it's been addressed in the book that we'll discuss today. What scope do RCTs actually have? Have they really dramatically improved the lives of poor people? Can they really ask causal questions about poverty? And, it's impact, and the effects of policy on poverty? Are there the other ways to address causal questions? And perhaps most importantly, is, is the supremacy of RCTs that we see in their economics scientifically legitimate and politically desirable? The book that we'll discuss today, Randomized Controlled Trials in the Field of Development, a Critical Perspective, brings together a set of scholars and practitioners of, two, of, two, of whom two are Nobel laureates in economics. And it is really an important contribution to this debate. We're lucky to have two of the three editors, and I'll introduce them shortly, along with two other speakers who will also discuss different aspects about RCTs and economic development. So let me now introduce the speakers. The first uh, speaker, the first two speakers are the two, ed two, ed co uh, two editors of the book, along with the third editor, Francois Roubault, who's an economist and statistician, a senior research fellow at the French Institute of Research for Sustainable Development, member of the DL Research Unit in Paris and a former head of the department. Um, Francois actually, and I know Francois worked for much for a long time, has initiated the mixed survey approach in household enterprises to measure the informal economy. It's very well, Francois has done remarkable work on what is now known as the one to three survey. Um, and also to develop gov governance modules which are crafted onto official household surveys that are now used to monitor SDG 16. You also have Isabel Guerra, who is also co-edited the book. Isabel is a social economist and a senior research fellow at the French Institute of Research for Sustainable Development. She specializes in the role of debt and credit in the dynamics of poverty and inequality. Isabel's work draws most from her own field-based original data, combining ethnography and statistical analysis, and is interdisciplinary and comparative in nature. Isabel tends to think quite a lot in her work about the conditional data production and the combination of methods. We're pleased to have two other speakers today. One of them is also a contributor to the book and is also somebody who can speak from a policy perspective. We have Gulzar Natarajan, who is an office of the Indian Advisory Service. Uh, Gulzar has served in the office of the Prime, Minister's, Prime Minister of India, managed infrastructure cooperation of the Andhra Pradesh state, as a district collector of Hyderabad, Chairman and Managing Director for Power Distribution Company in Shakabatnam and Municipal Commission of Jawada. Gulzar has a master's degree in international development from the Harvard Kennedy School. We're also pleased to have Rachel Gesselquist, Senior Research Fellow in UNU Wider. 
Rachel is a political scientist who works in the politics of developing countries with particular attention to inequality, ethnic politics, state building and governance, and the role of aid, democracy and democratization, and sub-Saharan African politics. Rachel will speak about her specific contribution she made after the Nobel Prize was, was awarded in, in the Journal of World Development on, on case study approaches to, to our, uh, as a comparison to our cities. Let me remind you now a little bit about lots of philosophical issues. So when you, uh, so when you send any questions, please use the Q&A button that you see on your screen. I will read out the questions on your behalf. That's really important. You must send in the questions using the Q&A uh, feature. The webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. So let's begin. And I would like to invite Franco and he's able to speak. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, everybody from all over the world. I'm very happy to be here. In fact, two, two facts. The first one is last year, you invited me uh, to present something at your seminar on informality, but at this time, we didn't know that COVID will happen. And I think that most importantly, we are in a transition maybe uh, to a new world and the connection uh, you made it with uh, COVID and our cities is, as you quoted it, uh, poverty alleviation uh, and the causes of global poverty and how best to combat it was the reason, the main reason why the Royal Swedish Academy of Science uh, attributed uh, the, the prize uh, to the three economists. And COVID, what is COVID principally? is uh, a massive shock on poverty. So we are exactly on the, on the topic. Uh, and the question we can raise today is the first thing is we won't forget the past and what have we learned from our cities in the world before is still important. And the second one is how our city could contribute to mitigate the shock now uh, in the world now and uh, maybe after. So what we are going to present with Isabel is two parts. The first, uh, I will present the making of the book and Isabel represent our takeaways from this book. And the idea underlying idea is does COVID uh, make a difference? And for this, we uh, prepare some questions for you as a poll you can see three questions, uh, generic one. Do you think that our cities uh, are uh, the best tool uh, to measure the impact of development intervention? The second question is about according to you, how much of what works and what does not in development can be evaluated by our cities with different thresholds? And, uh, and the third one linked to, to COVID, uh, with this massive increase in poverty uh, in the world, do you think that our city can make the difference in curbing the impact? So you will have the opportunity to answer this question and we may discuss it later. Uh, so why I would like to present very briefly our road to uh, this book uh, and first our motivations. Uh, it's a long run program begin nearly 10 years ago with an intriguing questions. We saw these curves or we have this, this curve, this figure in mind, uh, the exponential rise of what is called or what was called the gold standard in impact evaluation with potentially an eviction effect with other method. And we were wondering this, whether it's a true revolution or just a fashion uh, which uh, fate was to fade someday. Uh, so now I'm not able to, to go on with my presentation. Do you still see my presentation? Not anymore. Okay, so where is... Okay, I can't move my screen. So maybe... Now we can see it now, uh, Francis. Okay, now I, I can again. So. I put that in full screen. So that is the motivation for us. So we launch a research project without any funding, free research, and with the following research question, the, the question of what, 
what are the methodological property of RCTs and are RCTs really the holy grail in impact evaluation? And the question of why, why this road to global success? The core team, we built a core team of uh, colleagues and friends with different backgrounds, a political scientist, evaluator, and a geek. You will see why it's important from the donor side, Florent, Isabel here from the social economist perspective and qualitative approach from the academia and myself, economist and statistician, more prone to quantitative analysis and also from the academia. And from this first phase, uh, we published a first series of paper assessing RCTs technically, but also uh, what is called the randomistas, a short definition that the people that thinks that RCT is the best tool uh, to assess the impact. And what do we do? First, three things. The first is a theoretical critique and which is not new and the results are in line with others, famous people and some of them in the book, uh, questioning uh, RCTs in, in theory uh, with the question of internal and external validity. That's what we call doing the math. But more original, uh, we open two fronts. The first one is we develop an empirical critique of RCT. How RCT are done in practice in the field, how they are conducted. We call that doing the cooking. And for us French people, entering the kitchen is very important and maybe the most important. And the last uh, is to investigate the political economy of this scientific business of our cities, of the pro city movement and the people uh, working in this field. What are the main conclusions we draw from this uh, first phase? The first one is our cities are a sound tool to assess causal impacts, clearly. But first, it's limited to a yes, no answer an impact or no impact, and how much for the impact, but nothing on the why. So what are the channels so suggestive evidence can be provided? And that is a problem in when we think of the theory of causation. And the second constraint is RCTs is a good tool, but when it's conducted by the book and under circun uh, certain conditions, and these conditions are really rarely met in the real world because there's no virgin areas in the real world, contrary to what uh, RCT posits uh, to conduct uh, the experiment. Second, three of the randomistas' main claim are, according to us, illegitimate. The first one is that RCT is the only rigorous method or scientific method in town. Second, that RCTs can explain all what works and what doesn't, so the question in development. And the last uh, important thing is that replicating, multiplying RCTs on all topics, in all tropics, to overcome the problem of external validity uh, will solve the problem of this external validity, and that's what we call the hegemonical project. And the last conclusion about this political economy of our city is the strategy of market domination, uh, trying to build a monopoly or an oligopoly, oligopoly and rent captures, and describing uh, this successful business model in different audiences, mainly in the North, but not only. And also one important thing, which is not finished today, what we call the randomista hubris. And then from this, we begin a second phase of our research pro, uh, project in two parallel tracks. The first one from the bottom was the thorough investigation of a sector RCTs on microcredit. On one vocal microcredit uh, RCT in Morocco, and where we've done first a full replication and that's where our colleague Florent was key to this because we recorded all the, the, uh, the raw data, all the codes to try to rerun 
the results, and we see a lot of problem in all sphere from sampling, data capture, interpretation of results. And we raised the question uh, with the tendency to answer yes as garbage in, garbage out. The second was to go behind the scene, thanks to a unique documentation we have access to, like emails, uh, gray literature about the, the making of this RCT and showing why uh, we go to such a mess. And then maybe the question was, we were with the wrong RCT. This RCT has been conducted by the most famous randomista, including uh, Esther Duflo. Uh, but maybe it was the wrong one, especially bad. And randomly, uh, we uh, fall on this bad RCT. So what we've done is try to assess all the special issue, which has been published in 2015, by the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, which was and still is considered as sort of the last word on microcredit. So that is for the, uh, the, from the bottom, from the field track of our second phase of our research progress, uh, project. And the second one from the top is this collective book we are discussing today, entitled Randomized Control Trial in Development, a Critical Perspective just published at Oxford University Press. And here I show the outline very briefly of the, of the book. Uh, we uh, have 12 chapter and, and more. Uh, we try to distinguish the different parts in five or four blocks. The first one is sort of an overview, trying with main lead development economists, some more prone to uh, uh, to criticize RCTs and other which are more supporter uh, of RCTs, so trying to, to begin with the discussion and the controversy. The second part is, is sectoral approach, trying to see this property at the sectoral level uh, and discuss this sectoral approach in depth with uh, WASH uh, sector, global health and microfinance. The third block is a, a political economy approach. The first one on the rhetorics on how uh, things are written, the use of anecdotes uh, in, the, in particular in poor economics, the book, Poor Economics. And the second one is how RCTs, randomistas, uh, are in the community of evaluators. What are their positions and how they are considered by this community? And the fourth block is about trying to make some proposal. There are other chapters where we try to make some proposal to try to go beyond uh, just showing the limitation of our cities. One is on the uh, ethical concern, uh, raising issue in the, now in the COVID time. And the second one is trying to see how it can be used priors or compliance and non-compliance in the case of the paper chapter of James Ekman uh, to try to see how to improve our cities. And at last, but not the least, we've got some interviews, interviews from policymakers, so not the academia, from the North, basically France, but also from some colleagues uh, from India and Gulzar here is going to share with you uh, some of his views. And obviously, because we were quite weak as editors compared to the, the army and the generals uh, from the randomista at the top of the, the economic world, we uh, mobilized two previous Nobel Prize uh, to protect us. Uh, I uh, want to say Angus Deaton with a preface and uh, with an epilogue, uh, James Ekman. So now maybe it's time to see what do we think of all these research tracks. And Isabel, I think that's your time now. Thank you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you, thank you so much uh, to Wider for this uh, great uh, opportunity. Well, I, I'm not going to summarize the book. It is simply impossible given the diversity and, and richness of the contribution. I'm, I'm just going to highlight a few points. 
Um, the initial idea behind the, behind the book was to, to better define the scope of application of RCT. Very simply, what are the questions they can answer and what are the questions they cannot answer? To be able to do so, we, we have established a dialogue, dialogue between disciplines, a dialogue between scholars and policymakers, and also a dialogue between different visions regarding the scope of RCTs. And um, in the introduction of the volume, which reflects only the standpoint of the editors, um, the idea is to draw our own lessons of, of this dialogue. In fact, it is an attempt to, to answer the following questions. Ultimately, what opposes the advocates of RCTs and its opponents? What are the areas of, of, of disagreement? Or, or to put it differently, what are the terms of the debate? With three points here, uh, which are clearly uh, articulated, epistemology, politics, and ethics. And in fact, this, these three points are extremely useful to define uh, the scope of application of RCTs. So first, uh, the, the very first issue has to do with uh, epistemology, with here a certain form of positivism, even sometimes scientism, against what could be called uh, pragmatism. Um, are we looking for universal answers or are we looking for reasonable explanations, limited in time and space and attentive to the diversity of situations, including within specific groups? As many of you probably know, the claim of randomistas to universality has already been strongly criticized uh, because of, of their inability in a number of cases to demonstrate external validity. And what is true in a specific context might not apply elsewhere. Or to put it differently, the result of one particular RCT can hardly be generali generalized elsewhere. The limit of the average result as has also been uh, widely discussed and, and, and criticized. And RCT focused on, on the average result, while in many cases, what matters for policymakers and, and practitioners is, on the contrary, the diversity of the results, who gains and who loses from a particular intervention. Something which has been less discussed and which is very much in line with what we've done by the past regarding the empirics of, of RCTs is the gap between the protocol in theory and the protocol in practice. And here the question is, should we focus primarily on a theoretical protocol able of measuring causality and, and statistical inference? Or should we be concerned about the feasibility of the protocol, the way it is implemented in the ground, in, in the real world? And here, randomization might work well in theory, but the thing is that in practice, given the multiple challenges faced by the implementation in the ground, this is not the case. And, and in many cases, uh, field constraints contradict the assumptions of the statistical theorems used for inference. And those deviations between protocol and implementation can be observed all the way down the knowledge production line, from sampling uh, the at the level of the intervention, which might be artificially transformed to, to, fit, to meet the requirements of the protocol, at the level of data collection, and also at the level of the interpretation of the results. And in, in, in theory, the result is a simple comparison of average. In practice, the interpretation of the results involves a number of hypotheses, and even in some cases, an art of rhetoric that, that proved to be extremely persuasive. And all this, uh, uh, the, 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 the requirement of the theoretical protocol have a critical implication for the type of interventions RCTs can study and the type of, an, of questions they can answer. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and, and this brings us to the political question. The, 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 the second crucial aspect of the debate is uh, definitely a political one. What do we mean by development? In short, do we consider development and the fight against poverty as an aggregation of, of private goods and, and micro interventions? Or is development first and foremost seen as a matter of transformative politics, a matter of infrastructure, a matter of institutions? And here, regardless of the worldview of the randomistas, the technical constraints of the of RCT protocol force them to focus on micro interventions and private goods. Um, just to give you a few examples, in the field of, of, of poverty as a whole, do, do we look at microcredit or do we look at national, regional, or sectoral wealth creation processes? In the field of global health, do we look at financial incentives for the medical staff 
Or do we look at complex and systemic health systems, um, et cetera, et cetera. We, I can, we could have similar examples in, in, in many fields. In the, in, in the, in the, in the still, still regarding this issue of politics, for the reasons mentioned earlier, I mean, deviations between official protocol and, and, and real protocol, the ability of our cities to measure, in fact, is in fact rather limited. And quite often, our cities are in fact rather used to compare different modalities of a specific intervention. For instance, agricultural fertilizer combined with training or without training. And then the RCT is going to measure the outcome in terms of intervention take up. And this allow them to test behaviors. If we change prices, timeframes, if we provide information, assistance, training, and different sorts of training, different sorts of information, how do people behave? And, and how does this affect the take up? By this, I mean, whether people are going to use the intervention or not. Uh, how they're going to use the fertilizer, how they're going to use the microedit, how they're going to use a water filter and, and so forth. And I think this is a crucial lesson. lesson. In many cases, our cities are better adapted to test behaviors rather than evaluating impact. Well, we can look at this in two ways. One is to consider that this allows for a better understanding of behaviors, given that in, the, in many cases, the results challenge misconception in development economics. For example, in the field of microcredit, our cities have, have shown that contrary to a widespread belief, the poor are sensitive to microcredit. One can also look at this in another way uh, and consider that ultimately those kind of RCT are similar to what could be called social marketing. By this, I mean how to better distribute or sell a product, a microcredit, a water filter, an improved cook stove and, and, and so forth which we believe has a positive social impact. But in fact, in many cases, we still don't know. Well, if you consider development as an aggregation of micro-interventions, that's fine. And the impact issue remains unanswered. But if you consider development as a transformative politics, this is more uh, problematic. The last point has to do with ethics. Of course, any kind of research entails ethical issues. The thing is that RCTs are more concerned than observational studies since they manipulate the environment they study. A number of uh, ethical standards do exist. Informed consent, do not harm principle, provision of specifically considered protection for vulnerable populations, etc., etc. Here, the thing is that in many cases, randomistas ignore those standards. Why it is so? Here, yeah, our book, uh, through a specific chapter devoted on this by Abramovitz and, and Safars, shows that the answer is quite simple. There is a trade off between ensuring the internal validity of the protocol on the one hand, and on the other hand, guaranteeing the protection of the experiment's subject. And quite often, the first prevails over the second. Do we advance science or do we protect the people? As a way of conclusion, uh, let me get back to the issue of COVID, which was the initial promise of this uh, talk. Uh, the, the, the responses of RCTs in the development field uh, to the current crisis seem to largely confirm our observations. First, using the previous work and, and, and new RCTs, which are going on uh, at present, uh, uh, Randomista suggests to use nudges in various domains, uh, for instance, to increase insurance take up, to improve online schooling, uh, to improve social distancing behavior. So, uh, second, the advice that governments should make major investments in two areas, uh, cash transfers and mobile money infrastructure. Well, why not? I I'm not saying that it is useless. And here again, let me insist that the book is not at all intended to reject the use of RCTs altogether, but to better define their scope of application. So why not? But, but first, there is nothing very new here compared to what other methods or approaches could advise. Second, for the reasons already mentioned, evidence uh, regarding the impact of such or such intervention is sometimes doubtful. And third, and most importantly, the focus remains on individual interventions when there, when there has never been a greater need for structural responses. What about the constriction of value chains? What about the tax system? And, and what about the fiscal and monetary policy that can finance uh, cash transfers policy? 
what about the health policies? Crucial questions are still missing. Yeah. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gulzar, do you want to make your comments? Sure. Let me just uh, pull up my... Yeah. Uh, so greetings to everyone from different parts of the world. Uh, thanks to UNA, UNU Wider for uh, inviting us uh, for this program. And thanks also, Francois, Isabel, uh, for putting this very impressive collection of uh, 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 chapters on uh, RCTs, a critical perspective. Thank you very much. So I'm going to sort of just do two things. Yeah, OK. Uh, let me just pull this up. OK. Uh, let me preface that I view this debate from the perspective of a policymaker. To what, to this extent, I view research as a source of insights which can better inform or increase my understanding of the problem and its possible solutions and manage design of uh, solution, design of in interventions and policies. So instead of being just a critique of RCTs, I'll frame my intervention here as an effort to clarify on certain wide, widely held perceptions. Uh, being a policymaker, as well as more recently having been associated with international development for uh, nearly four years, I feel it's useful to make these clarifications. Before that, some comments about my uh, contribution to this book. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to, yeah, the screens, just a second, sorry, there seems to be some problem with this. So. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah. In, in my interview in the book, I have discussed three specific case examples of acclaimed RCTs, which claim to provide important insights to the respective development problems. The broad direction of my analysis just applies just as much to any RCT study from the very impressive list which uh, Rachel Gisselquist has so painstakingly compiled. Uh, the point is that headline efficacy establishing RCTs by themselves have very limited relevance to practitioners. Very few such hypotheses are under, under dispute. And if they were not adopted, it was not for lack of evidence. Now, I have also listed out uh, a set of uh, questions uh, which agitate the minds of policymakers at different levels of the government. It's like pretty big listing of uh, close to 100 questions, which policymakers at different levels grapple with almost on a daily basis. Uh, so this is about uh, field policymakers. Another bit about, say, what agitates policymakers who are grappling with issues of industrial policy. Uh, I'm just going to skim through this. Like, I'm not even going to. I'm just going to display it just to sort of illustrate the point. Uh, and then, what agitates policymakers as urban managers? And finally, COVID too. Uh, I mean, these are a bunch of questions which you could like. It's almost like a, if you have. If you can capture the word cloud of what's going on in the heads of a policymaker, you'll have a bunch of these questions popping out. Now, what's intriguing uh, when you look at all these things is that uh, how much of this is amenable to an RCT? Uh, as you will see from them, and I, for that, I uh, urge you to uh, buy the book and like uh, have a uh, read. Uh, so I'm not making a plug for that, but like just making that point. Uh, you, there are different kinds of issues which are amenable. These are not the issues which are amenable to an RCT, nor is an RCT likely to be able to provide any helpful insights to inform the practitioner's concerns. I now like to highlight a couple of general points about policy making and evidence, which I think will help clarify the view from a practitioner's side. Uh, the idea that policy decisions emerge uh, as a largely technical exercise with significant influence from, of, for evidence and space for its application is deeply questionable. So the two points I want to talk about are evidence, are policy and evidence. So first about, and these are, I, I, so these two slides basically summarize whatever I want to speak about. First, how does policy get made? Policies are never made on clean slates. They're political choices, there's only a small space available to exercise technical choices and choices are made in real time. 
we overestimate the technical agency over policy making. Policy versions and programs are mostly the result of marginal improvements to existing initiatives and are very rarely introduced as completely new versions. You won't see an aha moment with policy making. Oh yeah, we got this inflation targeting. That's great. Like it sort of changed the world. I mean, you will never have that. That's that's like cognitively, that's not the way policy gets made. In fact, in the realm of development, and especially in a large country like India, there's hardly anything non-technological that can be called an entirely new idea. For any idea, there is most likely to be at least a, a state or few districts where it's already been tried out over the years. The specific first order choices for research to influence are rarely if ever binary ones between cash transfers and in-kind provision or between public provision and outsourcing or between spending money uh, on building a road or maintaining existing roads or between building school buildings or hiring extra teaching vol volunteers. Those choices are most often already made or there are shades of gray in the choice. The degree of free freedom available is restricted to second order issues of execution. Intuitively, you can therefore imagine all these ideas in circulation in a vast landscape. Occasionally, due to a confluence of, fa of factors, primarily circumstances, implementation feasibility, and political expediency, an idea becomes ripe enough to get adopted on scale. Which brings us to the second point I wanted to make, which is about evidence. Now, we have seen, as we have seen, contrary to perception, policy making is not handicapped by lack of evidence of causality. And the lack of evidence is not the reason for non adoption of an idea or an intervention. Besides, like policy, with evidence too, there is no clean slate. It builds on legacies, priors, theories. This then raises a question of evidence for whom? We should make this distinction be between the evidence requirement for insider practitioners and outsiders. This is especially important since the producers of development research are most often outsiders. If we agree on the importance of evidence for insiders, then, as I mentioned earlier, I'll argue that hardly anyone would dispute the null hypothesis in the vast majority of uh, cases where RCTs have been conducted. And I, I know I'm making a really big statement here, but I, I, I honestly struggle after having gone through a list of RCTs over the last 15 years, I honestly struggle to find, find aha, this is something I did not know, huh? or like this is something which needed this expensive, uh, uh, time-consuming effort to sort of produce before the uh, this thing. Then comes to what kind of evidence. As mentioned earlier, evidence of efficacy from individual pilot conveys very little of significance. The challenge is with scale implementation. For reasons like weak state capacity, interventions which have been found impactful at small scale generally flounder when scaled up. This draws attention to the most important form of evidence, that which emerges during implementation, or specifically the analysis of administrative data from implementation, for example, it's a major category. So what do policymakers need as evidence? Conditional on the constraints mentioned about earlier, policymakers need insights about the program which can help them make the right choices on its design elements and implementation processes, not the headline stuff. More than the headline efficacy findings, practitioners are likely to be interested in the mechanisms and the responses. These are best generated by a combination of theoretical, empirical, and qualitative techniques. When viewed against this backdrop, my contention is that RCTs are seriously limited in their proximate or direct relevance to understand problems, explore situations, solutions, design programs, and then implement them. But like with any other research technique, RCTs too have their relevance. They, along with other research methodologies, have an important role to play in building the body of knowledge on development issues. For example, the hundreds of RCTs and other research methods have all contributed 
to the mainstreaming of ideas like the use of incentives to achieve program objectives, utility of nudges in overcoming behavioral failures, value of information to change norms, and so on. But then the theory of change with this approach is very different. In other words, RCTs have a role in building, as I said earlier, have a role in building a body of knowledge, which in turn, along with other factors, helps influence the debate and ripen the moment for adoption of an intervention or an idea. I'll just conclude with this. Now, Lan Pritchett once described development as a faith-based activity. I'll conclude by saying that RCTs have to have a role to play in building the faiths. Thanks for your patience. This is just what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gozar. It was very, very insightful. I will now ask uh, Rachel Kisilquist to make her comments. Rachel, go ahead. Okay. Um, let me just uh, try to share my screen here. Okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, for, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, serve as a discussant today. And I'd really like to congratulate the authors, the editors and the, the authors of this volume and encourage all of you to, to read it. Um, it's a really rich collection and, and really rich uh, set of work. Um, my role as discussant today, I think discussant is a little bit of a misnomer for what I've been asked to do, because usually a discussant is asked to speak very directly to the book and the presentation, the core presentation. But what I've been asked to do is, is something a little different, so to offer a comment and critique um, more broadly on the topic, and perhaps to prevent, uh, present some new material for the, the discussion. So in this vein, I'd like to uh, make three points. The first point um, is a point that I think the book makes very well, uh, that RCTs are not the gold standard for work in development. They are one tool and one tool does not serve all purposes. The sort of asserted hegemony of RCTs by some randomistas is simply not very helpful when we think about how do we accumulate knowledge on poverty and development around the world. And I think thinking about how we might use RCTs in addressing the current pandemic makes this abundantly clear um, as Isabel and Gulzar's uh, presentations also suggested. So there are certain things that we can't easily randomize. There are certain things that might be unethical to randomize. And um, focusing on how we can use RCTs uh, to study the current pandemic or to address the current pandemic can focus us, can push us towards perhaps uh, more minor questions when we should be thinking about other issues. I think, however, that you know, the broad argument that RCTs aren't the gold standard uh, isn't a new argument, right? This argument has been made by others. Um, I've made it myself in, in some previous work. But I think what this volume does that's really new, that's really interesting is that, well, not only is it incredibly comprehensive and at a very high level, but it also offers a critique of RCTs, not only in theory, but also in practice on the cooking of RCTs, uh, as Francois highlighted, um, and also of the, the industry of doing RCTs, sort of RCTs as a business. So I hope that with this volume, we can sort of lay to rest this debate it's very clear that RCTs aren't the gold standard. Um, the question is, when are they useful? How are they useful? And how can they be made more useful? The second point I'd like to highlight um, is that in using this tool, we want to pay extra attention to ethical issues. And I think that, that we as students um, and scholars of development are thinking more and more about ethical issues in this area as some recent debate uh, and critique, for instance, over the two papers highlighted in this slide in blue uh, suggest. Um, but I think that we want to, to be very sure to keep ethical issues in mind, both at the micro level and at the macro level. So at the micro level, I'm thinking of, of issues that I think experimentalists have paid a lot of attention to. So issues like informed consent, doing no harm to participants and so on. But I think there are also ethical issues that we should keep in mind at the macro level. And I would highlight two broad areas. 
So one issue is whether uh, is inequalities between researchers and research subjects. The ability to do RCTs in low income countries with low income populations that you might not be able to do in high income countries or with wealthy, uh, wealthy populations. And I think when we, we find this happening, we should be very concerned about the ethics of our, of our work. Um, secondly, I think at the macro level, we should think about um, the extent to which focusing on the method, on, on RCTs, might misfocus our attention on factors and hypotheses and policy interventions uh, that are easy to study with this method, but are perhaps less important than other things we want to be thinking about. So those are my first two points. I think that my, my third point is um, a bit more controversial. Uh, and that point, the point is that we should be cautious in using RCTs to build global knowledge on poverty and development. And we should be cautious because RCTs are basically like single case studies when we use them in this way. And we know, we know from a large literature in political science methodology that drawing causal inferences from single case studies is problematic. So the argument that I'm presenting here is presented uh, in, in more detail in a, a short article that I, I wrote uh, that came out earlier this year in World Development. Um, and I, I list it here, uh, it's open access, so you're welcome to read it. Um, but I'm going to just summarize the argument briefly in three stages. So the first part of the argument has to do with what is a case and what is a case study um, and what is small n research. In other words, research based on single case studies or a small handful, a small number of case studies and why it's problematic to use small n research to make generalizable causal inferences. I don't think any of the first part of this argument should be controversial. In fact, it's the type of stuff that we would cover in the first few weeks of an introductory political science methods class. Um, and the core issue here is the problem of many variables small n. So it's a degrees of freedom problem. If we're looking at one case or a small number of cases, how do we winnow out from a plethora of case specific factors and relationships, the variables or processes that cause the outcome of interest? We simply don't have enough cases to hold constant all the factors that might cause the, the thing that we're studying. Um, and so many of us in political science spend a lot of time doing small n research. And so we thought a lot about how we might address or how we might gain some leverage on, on addressing the many variables small n problem. And there are no good solutions. I mean, you can increase the number of cases, you can more systematically select your cases with reference to to theory, you can use comparative methods to um, analyze your cases more rigorously. Um, but you know it's a persistent problem. And uh, one of the core things that we emphasize in this literature is that you should be appropriately cautious and modest in making causal claims uh, based on single case studies. So the second part of my argument then is that RCTs, when we use them to build global knowledge, to build knowledge on global development and poverty, are basically single case studies. So let's start here by distinguishing two types of theories. On the one hand, there are theories formulated at the level of systems. So theories um, about communities, countries, cultures, nation states, and so on. And on the other hand, we have theories formulated in terms of variables observed within systems. So how do individuals or households react within a country or how do they act within a country or culture? I think it's, it's pretty clear that RCTs um, are testing theories of the second type. So they study how will individuals within a given experimental site, how will they react to an intervention? Um, randomistas will claim that their findings apply uh, across systems, but it's, it's a pretty big claim, right? We shouldn't assume that, that um, findings from within one system apply across other systems. 
Even micro theorists of development recognize that system level variables affect individual behavior. So individual behavior is influenced by institutions, by social norms, by social and political context. And these are system level variables, system level factors that influence um, incentives, that shape incentives, that uh, set the rules of the game, that shape how incentives and rules are interpreted subjectively. It's really on, only under very strong assumptions that we should expect findings from one system to apply seamlessly to all systems without analyzing that it, without testing that they do. So, you know, where does this leave us, right? If RCTs are like single case studies and single case studies are problematic for causal inference, what do we do? Um, I think uh, this leaves us sort of in three places. One point is that current approaches by randomistas to address the external validity problem aren't fully adequate. They give us only weak leverage on how the cases we choose affect the answers we get. Secondly, um, we might be able to do a bit more in terms of addressing external validity challenges by thinking more systematically about how we can use uh, some of what we know about case selection and comparative methods to think about how to select experimental sites or how to comparatively analyze findings across experimental sites. Um, and then finally, this leaves us again in pointing out that RCTs aren't the gold standard and, um, and those doing this type of work, it's very rich. It can offer really interesting insights, but appropriate caution and um, the appropriate caution should be taken in making claims about generalizable causal inference. So let me uh, stop there um, and uh, hopefully we have some good time left for discussion. Um, thank you, Rachel. I think your last point is very important that the need to be very cautious about making causal claims, given that in fact the RCT revolution is about making causal claims. <laughs> Right. Okay, so I, we have a couple of questions and thanks so much for the speakers for keeping to time because we have approximately 25 minutes for UNA. So let me go to the questions now. Um, and the first question is possibly for Francois and Isabel, but the other speakers can also respond. Um, the first question is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, policymakers need to respond quickly to ever-changing conditions. Do you think there's any difference in speed between RCTs and other methods? Let's take this question first. Um, Francis and, and Sibel, do you think there's a difference between RCTs and other methods given the situation we are in, the pandemic? Isabel, do you want to intervene? Um, yeah, I can start. Yeah, this is, of course, a, a, a fundamental question. Um, and, and the time of, for research is not, the, is, is, is not the same as the time of, of policy decisions. And this is true for all type of research. I mean, research is always very slow. We know that. But it's true that the gap between the, the, this gap is even more uh, pronounced for RCTs. I mean, in a typical RCT, you need the baseline, you need the end line, and usually there is a minimum of five years before the start of the research and, and the results. And, 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 and while at the same time, the gap between the baseline and the end line is often too short to really be able to measure uh, what we are looking at. Uh, and the gap between the, the baseline and the end line is hardly more than two years, which is often too short and which, is, which often force um, RCT researchers to focus on midterm indicators. I'll give you a few examples. In the field of uh, health microinsurance, for instance, uh, the indicator, the primary indicator was uh, how much money has been saved, which is a very important indicator, but it was too short to measure the impact in terms of uh, uh, health improvement. Um, agriculture, uh, usually the indicators are going to be whether farmers have been able to use inputs or, or have, been, uh, 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 have they been able to improve technology, but not the final indicator, which is have they been able to produce more and to earn more. Uh, but the, again, the, the gap, the, the, the time frame is too short. So on the one hand, it's too long for policymakers. On the other hand, it's too short uh, to be able to demonstrate uh, what, what is really the, the, the ultimate indicator that we want to look at. At the same time, we should not blame RCTs for all evils. I mean, any kind of research in the present day is too slow. I mean, we, and, and, and we also have to mention the fact that the recent forms of RCTs 
uh, are, are use different techniques to avoid the, 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 the baseline and are able to, to produce results more quickly. So uh, yeah, all this to give us some kind of nuance answer to, to this question, which is a crucial one. Yeah. Yes, to complement Isabel's answer. Now, a first point which is important is criticizing RCT is a duty when the uh, pro-RCT proponent claim that it's the best or the only method in town. Uh, if we consider RCT, and it would be, I would like the uh, randomist to acknowledge this, that RCT is just one tool among others. Uh, maybe there is some question which are valid for RCT and others. We saw that for ethics or ethical concern, maybe RCT is more concerned with this. But the idea is, uh, if there is no claim that RCT is the gold standard, many critiques which are made to RCT may apply to other methods and, and it's okay. To go back to the question, speed of RCT, just a standard RCT with a life cycle of five years from the beginning to the publication, uh, mounting the project to the publication of the results, let's say five years for an impact of one year between the baseline and the, the end line. So clearly uh, it's not uh, the time frame needed for COVID. But the second point is Let's take the example of cash transfer, which is one of the, the key uh, takeaway from uh, J-PAL today to, to try to answer the COVID. And going to God's proposal, do we need RCT to conduct cash transfer now? Do we need to wait, let's say two years to say what we need to put in place cash transfer? They may be per not perfectly targeted like in Brazil where I'm here, but they are key uh, to alleviate uh, the current crisis. So that's, that's my answer uh, to the question. Uh, thank you, Francis Isabel. Can we uh, display the poll results maybe at this point before I get to the next question? It would be great. Are you surprised by any of the responses? It seems the second and the first question, the second option was the Dom, absolutely the dominant response. RCTs can be a relevant evaluation too, but not always, depending on the question and the context. And then the second question, according to how much of what works and what does not in developing can be valid for RCTs. Again, the answer is some. Would that you might have expected, uh, Franz Ernest Herber? I would say that for the two first question, I would have answered the same at the mode of the, the answer we can see on the screen. Where maybe I would have disagreed is on the third, uh, which is a bad, for, so for the two first question, I don't know if we convinced the audience uh, to align with what we think, or it was already a convinced audience uh, from the start of the, of the, but maybe we should conduct an city to try to to assess the causal impact of these results. <laughs> Where well, I'm more uh, in disagreement with the, the answer or surprised or is on the third point uh, with the idea that uh, RCT more or less it's 50-50 <clears throat> with RCT can make a difference. Uh, I don't know if I elaborate on this or maybe first Isabel your comment on this or just a point on this for me uh, we've got a specific uh, reason to think that RCT are not uh, adapted to be the solution or the main solution, the basic solution for what we are confronted to. We talk about the ra rapid response, so I think that we don't have this. But one point is, uh, we said that the context, and I, I refer to Rachel presentation. So case studies in normal times. Now we've got case studies and the context has totally changed. So we can clearly uh, contest and, and, and say that with this big change, which results would all? 
Does the answer to microcredit be the same in COVID time or as it was previously? And the second point, uh, which is linked also to this macro big uh, shock is the emergence of spillovers. We've got with this shock, one of the, the, the most important uh, since one century, uh, a massive shock and with general equilibrium effect much more important than its normal time. And RCT is not able to answer this, uh, this, tri this type of uh, spillovers. So for me, in this situation, I think that RCT is less suited uh, to answer the questions than in normal times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let me move to the question, uh, second question. And I can ask my, this is my colleague, Sam Jones. Uh, oh. Sam, you want to ask the question live? You're, you've been given permission by the chair to do so. Sam? Not sure Sam's online. Uh, Ricardo Santos also has a question. Ricardo is also one of our colleagues. Ricardo, do you want to ask your question? I'm here. I just couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. Oh, right. I sorry, sorry, Sam. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I needed to be unmuted by the host. No, I was. Uh, all I had kind of two broad comments. One, I'm I'm not sure that randomisters actually are claiming a kind of a user, universal application of their findings, although I would kind of agree that their rhetoric uh, does sometimes suggest that. And then uh, secondly, I'm kind of interested in uh, all of the panelists' views actually on. This difficulty, we might say, between academic RCTs, which contribute to a broad corpus of knowledge, versus you know practical RCTs to evaluate something uh, specific, which might then be implemented. And the difficulty with the first group, the academic RCTs, is how does this square with our ethical obligations not to exploit participants. And that's particularly relevant when control groups rarely receive any benefits whatsoever, and there's very little scope for them for, for the, uh, the intervention or uh, to be rolled out to them at a later point in time. So I'm interested in, in the views on this uh, ethical dilemma, perhaps. Thank you. So, Isabel and Francois, would you want one of you to respond to respond Sam's comments here? Yeah, maybe a, a point regarding the, uh, well, Sam is saying, I don't think randomista claim universal application of findings. It's true that um, many of them, and probably all of them, if you ask them the question, will tell you, yes, we are very open to other methods. And we have a chapter in the book by, uh, by Tim Ogden, who is, who, is, who is supporting randomista and, 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 and who, is, who, is, uh, who have this argument. The thing here is we have to make a distinction between what they say and what they do um, if you look at uh, most of the, I mean, for all the publications that we have read, uh, it's fascinating to see uh, the, the, uh, the fact that they completely ignore what has been said on that particular topic in the past and, and by any other methods than RCTs. And which, I mean, so here, for, for, for me, this is the, the, the best proof of their uh, claim for superiority, and which is very problematic because they, I mean, they, they, they by, by by make, making a clean sweep of previous research. I mean, they start almost from, from zero. And while uh, in many topics, I mean, we already know, I mean, this is also what Gurza was saying. I mean, research is all, all, always a, a small addition to what have been done in the past. And, and, the, 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 and there are different issues here. I mean, one is that uh, by ignoring what has been already done, uh, they ask the wrong questions. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, and the other aspect is uh, the fact that the, the performative uh, consequences of this with, with a number, and this leads us to the, the, the political economy of the randomista uh, industry um, that uh, uh, Francois was talking about. What we, what we show in the book, I mean, uh, in a number of chapters, is the fact that the, the crowding out effect of, of this kind of discourse uh, in terms of methods, uh, in terms of uh, resources, not only money, but also human resources. A, a point made by uh, Inna Patnik uh, is to say that uh, in India, you have a, a huge number of young, uh, uh, brilliant economics, economist scholars who are uh, not moving necessarily to the US. It's not a brain drain, but it's a, it's a, I don't know how to call it, 
uh, it's a method drain, no? who are pushed to do RCTs uh, because, because, because if you want to be a well-known economist now or just to find a job, you need to do, random, uh, to, to do RCTs. Um, and, and, the, and the last uh, uh, effect, crowding out effect in terms of intervention, if you take the case of global health, for instance, uh, the rise in RCTs is not the only uh, explanatory factor, but it's fully part of a movement towards uh, a vertical health. I mean, uh, I mean, health in silos where you just treat a particular disease instead of building um, a social protection system and, and instead of building uh, complex uh, health uh, system uh, which are able to treat any kind of disease. So for me, this claim of for superiority, first, we, we, it's not enough to hear about what they say, we have to see at what they do. And we also have to look at all the uh, uh, consequences of this claim for uh, universality, which is, according to me, very uh, damaging. Yeah. That's why we are so keen in, 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 in criticizing their work, because we, we, do, we really see the perverse effect in a number of domains. Yeah. Uh, I had a question uh, put for you, Sabel, and it's on ethical issues on RCTs. Let me take a specific example. So right now we have large RCTs going on around the world, in, in, including in developing countries. In fact, a lot of them are developing countries on vaccines for COVID-19, right? This RCT is going on where they're giving the vaccine to some part of the population, randomly, and some others, they're giving placebos. My question is that those RCTs, we see in medical research, do you see a different, or do you see a different ethical issue there? In other words, medical research is okay to do RCTs of that type, which we are doing right now, while it is not okay to do it in economics or social sciences. Do you see a different problem? Or do you think that RCTs in themselves, wherever you apply them, medical research or social sciences, including vaccine trials going on right now, are, are not ethical? Well, uh, I mean, those ethical issues are, are, I mean, what we can say is, is, and here I'm talking on behalf of, of different authors from the, from the book we, who, are, who have been really looking at this ethical issue uh, uh, in details. I mean, we have this book by um, uh, a duo, I mean, an economist and, and someone from the medical field who is, who is uh, a doctor himself. And I've been working together on, on, on this aspect, trying to, to understand why it is the case that uh, in the field of, uh, in the medical field where RCTs have been, have been used for decades and decades and where uh, very strict ethical guidelines have been established. Um, why it is the case that uh, all, although uh, um, uh, RCTs prom promoters in the field of economics are claiming to import this method from medicine, uh, coming to ethics, they ignore uh, the, those uh, standards. And uh, the only thing I can I can say is that uh, uh, as uh, is that in in, in in too many cases those ethical standards are, are not are not followed. And for the for the very simple reason that I was mentioning, first of course it is more complicated uh, than uh, there is a clear difference that in 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 the field of development it is of course more difficult to give, to give a, a placebo. Uh, and, but here very clearly, uh, the, 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 the explanation is the one I was, I was, I was giving uh, when I was uh, speaking earlier, the fact that uh, the argument put forward again and again by Randomista is in the long run, people will benefit from it because, because of the, thanks to the advance uh, in, 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 in science, uh, thanks to RCTs. So again, we see the fact that science comes first uh, before the protection of the, of, of the, of the, the participants. But here, maybe um, not to, to avoid uh, uh, putting all the blames on RCTs, I think that the key question is uh, how it is possible that those practices are accepted uh, at, at different levels. I mean, what are ethical committees doing? And what are journals doing? Usually journals should make sure that uh, a research uh, follow uh, basic uh, ethical rules. And uh, the example given by Russia is uh, uh, on, on Kenya is, is completely uh, uh, unbelievable. And I think here the, the academia as a whole has a responsibility. And, and I think the, 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 the excesses of, of and, and the, 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 yeah, all those malpractices express a kind of, uh, um, how shall I say, something which is going wrong in the academia world, which is not able anymore to make sure that the research are, 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 are respecting 
basic uh, ethical uh, guidelines. And I think the academia as a whole has, has, has a strong responsibility uh, in, in this. Yeah. Yeah, I should mention that there are many medical professionals who do not also agree with RCTs in medical science too. That's why yeah. I asked. Yeah. Does anybody want to have a response also on the ethical issue, social science versus, versus natural sciences? No. no. Yeah. Not, not only ethical issue, but I think that one debate on RCT today is all the, the energy uh, based on the, the elaboration of a vaccine is based on RCT, or not all the energy, but RCT are very legitimate in the field of uh, medicine. And we are all waiting for this third phase to get this vaccine. But the first point, if, if you look at what's happening today, a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest for RCT in medicine, but who has ever heard of something of RCT in, in economics, in development, but more broadly in economics? Nobody, I mean, Brazil uh, for the cash transfer, nobody think about an RCT to try to see if it should put in place or not. So RCT in medicine seems to be at the front page uh, clearly and RCT in development has nearly no voice in the debate, debate of COVID today. The second point is if we think, and I think it's very clear, administrating a vaccine is not the same as changing a behavior. And so if we think that context matter more for RCT in development or RCT in economics than RCT in medicine, uh, we understand why uh, these RCT in economics are just out of the debate uh, today. And just one point, interesting point is, even in medicine, uh, the very famous John Hall, The Lancet and, and other, published on the one hand, the meta-analysis of RCT on non-pharmaceutical intervention uh, during the COVID, uh, face makes, eye protection, personal distancing, with a systematic uh, Cochrane review and meta-analysis. And they found no result at all. On the other hand, there was another meta-analysis which used observational data for more or less the same uh, the same uh, interventions, uh, and they found the positive results. And the question is, do we have to rely on RCT, this meta-analysis, waiting for new ones to put in place these kind of measures, or do we be should believe, uh, at least for the moment, with the precautionary uh, principle, uh, these uh, results from meta-analysis on observational data? So I think it's an open question. I've got my own answer. That's right, Isabel. Uh, I have a question again for one of my, our colleagues, uh, Ricardo Santos. Uh, Ricardo, if you're still there, could, do you want to ask your question live? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the, this very important book and the thought-provoking presentations from the four of us, from, from the four of you. I would have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, so having established that there are questions RCTs are insufficient in answering, do you find that are, there are questions RCTs have been used to answer, but should, not should, not, should definitely not be used to answer them? The second is, uh, building on what you've learned studying uh, the kitchen where RCTs are cooked, uh, in what way should RCTs be part of a multi-method research package? Or to ask it differently, do you see methods that work well with RCTs complementing what we can learn from them? You got a, two great questions, thank you. Um, again, Isabel and Francois, maybe here, I think even Rachel, you might want to come in. Um, so Isabel, Francois, who, do you want, who wants to answer Ricardo's questions? So the first question is, should there be not yeah. been any example not being used, RC not being used? Uh, Maybe Isabel, a word on micro microcredit, where the answer from RCT are not adequate to what really uh, is the impact, we can think of the impact of this, this kind of intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the, 
and I think it's not only true for microcredit, but I can take this as an example. Uh, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, or we all mentioned earlier, um, regarding this particular case of microcredit, I'm, I'm quite clear in saying that at present, RCTs don't bring anything to the debate. Uh, the only interesting result could be the low take up. I mean, this, this, there, was, there was a special issue on microcredit published a few years ago, uh, bringing together uh, uh, five or six RCTs done in different uh, uh, regions of the world. And uh, one of the very first results was the fact that the take up was quite low. And, but this has been said earlier by others, but since they don't, since they ignore this kind of statement, um, they, 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 they do as if it was new. Well, maybe the thing, the interesting thing compared to what has been done by the past was to, 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 to give figures. The thing is that um, regarding the technical constraint of RCTs, the figure in terms of take up don't tell us anything to make sure that, the, 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 that they will be able to, to, to follow their, their research protocol, having a, 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 a place where nobody has been, a, has been benefiting from microcredits and, and compare, comparing it to, 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 to another place, we need to, you need to go to a very specific place where microcredit has never been there. So the place is very specific. The population is very specific. So at the end of the day, the, mean, the, the, the interpretation of the figures are very difficult. And at the end of the day, we have no idea about about the, the representativeness of, of, of this population. Then another um, so-called innovative result is that micro, microcredit does not transform the poor into, into entrepreneurs. I mean, this is, I mean, anyone who is, not, who is part of the microfinance world know this very well. Um, and, 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 and you have much more research uh, from political economy, sociology, economic anthropology, analyzing the reasons behind this which is not the reason behind, behind this is not a matter of individual behavior. You know, Banerjee and Duflo write, it's too hard. No, it's not too hard. It's not a matter of individual behavior. It's a matter of, of how the market are structured and the fact that in a number of cases, uh, if you don't belong, belong to the right group, you cannot start your business. You don't have access to suppliers. You don't have access to clients. Markets are organized along uh, monopoly or, or, or oligop oligopolistic uh, uh, lines. And so, for, or, or simply you don't have any demand. So here again, it's a matter of general equilibrium. Well, I could continue for hours, um, but all this to say that they, they, they simply don't bring anything to the, to, to, to the debate. And they also ignore questions which are crucial. The issue of over indebtedness, for instance, which for me is a burning issue, is a, is a time bomb in, in, in many parts of the, globe, of, of the global south. And, and for reasons which I, which I don't understand, our, our city promoters simply ignore this question, which is why it is a crucial one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe, Monsieur, just right, point, I think that, yeah, I think that uh, Rachel and Gulzar are part of the control group. They are not aware of this, but uh, they are the control group, and we are the treatment with Isabel. And I think it's important, and the treatment is having edited the book. I'm sure that the control group uh, can give also sound answers to the question. So I think that uh, we would like to hear from Rachel and, and maybe Gulzar. A question for Gulzar, uh, two questions. But Rachel can probably also come back on the question of, of com complementing OSIP's other methods. The question I had for Gulzar, one question already that's there, but also want to add my own question. So one question is that, you know, resource constrained con African countries in this particular question, but also, of course, India also, the same situation. I'm trying to develop national evaluation systems because every policymaker wants to know how to better to do some a policy, right? So when we have this constraint on resources, how exactly do you, given the given the dominance of RCTs, how exactly do you counter it? And my specific question is, Gulza, that in India, as you know, um, JPAL have been doing a lot of RCTs with governments, of both the national government and the state governments, even as you know in Andhra Pradesh. So, and here's the paradox that you mentioned, that state governments and national governments in India and also in Africa and other parts of the world are working with JPAL for this very large scale RCTs, very expensive RCTs, when, as you've said, the implications of the policy implications are not particularly very relevant or anything very new. So how, how does one explain this paradox? One is the fact that many developing country governments are under a lot of resource constraints trying to develop their own evaluation systems there's a big push towards RCTs. And paradoxically, they're working with, uh, with JPAL and others, other uh, impact evaluation groups on RCTs, which may actually not be very useful for them. 
in terms of the findings. How do you explain this paradox? So uh, I think we need to step back a little bit. You know, I think there is a lot of what you call myths and folklore which floats around RCTs. Uh, you use the word phrase uh, uh, working with governments. Now, typically, not just like typically, I'm pretty sure like if you pick up 100 RCTs, you pretty much close to 99 would theory of change would be something like this. Uh, here is an idea, somebody, something comes up to somebody's mind. Uh, they then pick it up, scout around for a funder, funder gets mobilized, then they go around to a, a, a lower or middle level, I'm, I'm typically talking about India, a lower or a middle level bureaucrat, uh, not even an IAS officer, perhaps a, even an IAS officer, and ask them, hey guys, you know, look what we've mobilized this, this seems a cute little, this thing, this is great, like some profile, so why don't we do it? And What's the skin in the game? What does the bureaucrat lose by having somebody uh, come and plug in in, a, in the most non-invasive of and non-burdensome of manner uh, and do something? What's so? I'll tell you what. There is a there is one world in which the debate about RCTs happen. There is another world in which real world of where things happen. They actually overlap very little. They really, I mean, I, you, you, I've worked at every level of government from a local government to a district, to a state, to the, to the, to the top office in India. You really, I've seen this whole thing play itself out. Evidence, what is spun as folklore outside is very different from what is seen inside. I'm just saying this because I really think it's an important uh, mm. uh, thing for everybody. I, I, for example, no, I'll just share the screen uh, on the COVID questions. Uh, I mean, I had, it, these are questions which I would have to grapple if I become Secretary Health. I mean, any of us could become this like any time huh? in, uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, just tell, have a look and see how many of them have, can, in any way be uh, uh, sort of resolved using RCTs. It's seriously a really, really small uh, numbers. I mean, small uh, things. So, I mean, I, it's not even a first order thing. We are like second, third order, maybe fourth order, some A-B testing of something which is happening in real time. Huh? Maybe something which you can give a result in two weeks. Outside that, zero. And there was a question about what damage, I can recount several list out. In fact, of the three things which have been listed out, which are, which, which are illustrated in, that, uh, in my interview, two of them are positively damaging. I, I, I'd say positively damaging. The good thing is that bureaucrats have obviously more, the, the, like they understand what's, what's to be picked up and what's not to be picked up. And like in the process, a lot of this is like, people think, oh yeah, RCTs are taken great seriously in India. Well, that's fine. Very nice. Thank you so much, Shibu. That's very, very insightful. Uh, Rachel, we're very badly out of time, but do you want to respond very quickly on the, what else, how can we complement RCT, especially from a qualitative point of view? Yeah, sure. Just very yeah. quickly on this question about multi-method research. I mean, I think the sort of implication of my presentation is that there, there are some, some really interesting things that could come about from combining uh, comparative methods and case study methods with RCTs. So if you think, for instance, about, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work by Esther Duflo and colleagues about the impact of, for instance, female reservations um, on political attitudes and, and gender relations in India. And um, one of the policy implications, for instance, that follows from that is, you know, maybe gender quotas are a way that we can think about changing gender norms. So if we take that, um, we could think about different ways that we could use comparative methods to explore that finding more by testing it, you know, by, by doing similar RCT analysis in, in say, um, another country with, for instance, very different uh, system level characteristics. Um, so this would be sort of a most different system design uh, that it was what we would call it, right? In political science 
terms. Um, and so if, if the finding holds up across this sort of analysis, then we would, we would have more faith in the finding. So I think there's a lot of scope for combining these sort of qualitative case study methods with, with RCT uh, analysis. Okay, that's great. On that very positive note, Rachel, actually. <laughs> Uh, let's end this webinar. Thanks so much um, to uh, Isabel, Francois, Gudzar, and Rachel for really insightful presentations. And we got some great questions from the audience. Thanks so much for that. So I'll, I'll call this webinar to a close. And again, as uh, Rachel mentioned earlier, everybody should read the book. It's really amazing that how much uh, Francois, Isabel, and you at your, with your, the co-editor co brought together so many different voices in one place, including I think the very important voices of the policy, the policy side, such as Gulzars. I think that's quite remarkable. I haven't, we haven't seen anything like that before and well done for that. And I hope that this book becomes standard reading in any development economics course anywhere in the world. It, it has to be, absolutely. So take care, thanks so much and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity. It was great. Thanks. Bye. A lot, bye.